I'm now going to welcome our first speaker to stage from Metacore. Please, please come up and, and, and take me, remove me from this. Get out of here. Take stage. Oh, get out of here. I'm gone. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Tepposan, and I'm a game lead at Metacore Games. Uh, we do mobile games. Our biggest hit game at the moment is uh, Merge Mansion. And I'm here to talk a little bit about how we do concept testing at Metacore Games. So let's get started. I wonder how this works. Press it, maybe? Hmm? Does it work? No? Can I click her? No, yeah, cool. So, <clears throat> why do we do concept testing? The idea of concept testing is basically to try and predict if a game has potential. So, game development is quite costly. It costs time and money, and time is probably the, usually the more scarce resource, because you can do, do only so much in so short of a time. All of us game developers have a bunch of cool ideas that we'd want to try out. We think that this is going to be awesome, this might be awesome, and that might be awesome. There's only so much time. I think if you think about your whole career, you can probably make tens of games instead of hundreds of games during your career. So you've got to pick your battles in a way. I have way more ideas than I have time to <coughs> develop. So we want to try and predict if a game would be successful. So here's a rough idea of how a mobile game, game could be developed. You first develop a game concept, and then you create a playable prototype, you soft launch it, you get some retention metrics, marketing metrics, and put the game live, and then you get a bunch of money. Usually, at this stage, you do a soft launch, and usually around that stage, you will see if the game is successful or not. You'll start getting some proxy metrics like retention that should is considered to be a really good, good kind of predictor of uh, financial success for a game. But the problem over here is that it can take you months, it can take quite a bit of time for you to get a game ready for soft launch. You need to create a concept, you need to create a bunch of art, you need to program the whole thing, you need to design and that sort of stuff. Usually, if you soft launch a game in two or three months, it's considered super fast. Sometimes it might take a year or even multiple years. So this is the reason why we try to predict success already at an earlier stage. These are not foolproof methods or anything like that, but it's still something that should help you at least avoid the biggest pitfalls. So, at Metacore, we try to do this already during pre-production. And the key to making successful games is, of course, trying to figure out what the audience would like and what they wouldn't like. So, <coughs> Again, this, um, you can see this pipeline picture over here. We've changed it a little bit to kind of fool around with the terminology and that sort of stuff. But at Metacore, we start thinking about the game concept in the earlier stage kind of more widely with the fantasy of the game. We're in the entertainment industry, and uh, a big part of selling our products is to sell some sort of fantasies to the players. So the fantasy, in our case, means basically it tries to encompass the type of promise that we as game developers give to the players. This is the type of experience that you will be having. This is the type of entertainment that you will be enjoying when you start playing this game. This is how we form the fantasy. You can think about it as some sort of a trailer for your movie or, I don't know, like the description of, in a can, bag of candies, like it's going to be really sweet and sour and whatever, that sort of stuff. That's a promise for the person buying that entertainment product, what, what they will be experiencing when they actually start enjoying this thing. So, we start already testing <coughs> the game fundamentals in the early stage. We try to figure out whether the game has potential already here instead of the soft launch phase. This is mainly <coughs> because it is... At an earlier stage, we haven't invested that much in the game, and if we find some fundamental issues with the game, we can cut our losses earlier. Of course, we have to accept the fact that at an earlier stage, 
we are going to be more prone to error. This is not going to be super accurate or anything like that. The accuracy increases as we move forward. So in the earliest days when we're testing concepts, the accuracy is going to be low. We're going to be basically able to root out super bad ideas, and we're going to be able to maybe detect some ideas that are better than others. But we have a huge uh, <clears throat> margin for error over there. We're going to have to deal with a lot of uncertainty at this point. We move forward to the next stage when we start doing a playable prototype. We get more accuracy. Our tools are better since we have an interactive product at that point. It'll get more accurate. But even at that point, we're not 100% sure. We go to soft launch. And everybody who's soft launched the game will know that there's still plenty of room for fuck ups at this stage also. So you can basically make a game that has awesome retention, doesn't monetize at all. It's not really workable at that point necessarily. Or you can have bad retention and kind of good monetization metrics or whatever. But it is still possible to screw up at this point. <clears throat> but anyways, the point being that we increase our certainty, confidence, as we move forward in the pipeline. But we try to do it at every single stage. So what does this mean in practice? What are the practical tools that we use for this? <clears throat> the key, as mentioned, is to try and understand what the audience likes and doesn't like. And something that we've been thinking about is kind of maybe if you're trying to pitch something to your friend or family or whatever. For example, let's watch a movie this afternoon. I'll go to my daughter and pitch her a movie like, hey, daughter, let's go watch a movie. And then she's like, okay, what kind of movie do you want to watch? So it's like, there's this Lord of the Rings thing. It's really awesome. And it's like got wizards and swords and that sort of stuff. And she's zoning out. It's like, oh, boring. That sort of stuff. That already, that small pitch already tells me that she is not interested in this thing. And then I pitch another thing. Well, let's watch something else. That's, there's like a Marvel thing where there's superheroes and they're flying around and shooting a bunch of stuff. It's like, yeah, I like superheroes. Let's, let's do that. So, okay. Now, this really, really simple pitch already has taught me that my daughter prefers superheroes over fantasy stuff. And that is something that we try to, try to utilize a little bit. So, <clears throat> we try to figure out what the fantasy would be, what kind of fantasy would be uh, roughly suitable for the players. So, what is player fantasy? In, in gaming context, it's a combination of a lot of things. It's basically the, somehow tries to encompass the experience the players will have once they start playing the game. It's a combination of game mechanics, it's a, it encompasses art, it has the premise and all that stuff. It's basically what the players can expect when they start playing, playing your game. And we try to make sure that these players, we have an audience for the type of fantasy that we're selling. So we're not trying to sell a mech game for elderly people or whatever, that sort of stuff. Some things are just complete mismatches. Some things you'd know intuitively that my girlfriend is not a fan of pirates and that sort of stuff. I wouldn't try to sell a pirate game for her. That's kind of, I know it because I know her relatively well. But some things are not as intuitive as you would imagine. Sometimes you find, find out things about your audience that are unexpected, or actually quite often you find out things. Here's an example. So here's two games that you could describe as zombie shooter games, kind of grimy, dark zombie shooter games. But when you look at those images, it's really obvious to everybody that these games offer a vastly different fantasy from each other. You can see that both are kind of dark. You can see the gloomy colors, the colors over there. And both of them are, have zombies. Well, Last of Us, you need to know that there's zombies. But anyways, it has zombies, I can assure you. And then <laughs> both of them have shooters. They have guns in the uh, images. But when you look at Minigore's image, it's way more wacky. It's more playful and that sort of stuff. And it tells you something about the type of experience this game will give, will offer you. And look at Last of Us, it's clearly more dark and more grimy and that sort of stuff. It clearly offers you a more cinematic, a more serious type of an approach to the same type of a thing, even though they're both zombie shooter games. 
So this is basically roughly, you can see that there's a different type of a fantasy that these games offer. So how to go about it? Let's pick a starting point. For us, a good starting point is usually the premise. Some sort of description, short description about what the game would be, what, what is the type of fantasy that this game would be offering in just text format. And why text format? <coughs> we chose to start writing text because it's really easy and quick to make. It is super quick. A person like me alone can write two or three premises a day, <coughs> text premises a day, and then test this really quickly. The next stage, if you go into visual testing, you start creating visual images, uh, art assets, maybe gameplay images, or let alone videos. That will take you way more than a day to make a visual representation of a game. Maybe AI will help us in the future, but at the moment it seems to be still pretty hard to describe some sort of a visual image to an AI and make it look exactly how you like in a day or so. So, we start with test, text, only testing. I write a bunch of premises, text premises, some, a few sentences describing what the fantasy of the game would be. I push them to an audience using Playtest Cloud. You could use any other service. Uh, Playtest Cloud is just something that we're familiar with. It might be super skewed, there might be issues with it, but it is still a service that gives you answers. Survey Monkey, whatever, use anything. And then we ask audiences to rate them. Once the audience has rated these um, text surveys, these text uh, premises, I mean, we pick the best ones and we discard the worst ones. Usually in this stage, we ask players to give some sort of feedback. Why did you like this thing? Why didn't you like this thing? That sort of stuff. That'll start giving us already a pretty good understanding of what the player base enjoys and what they don't like. We keep the best ones and we discard the worst ones. Then we repeat this process. We, as you can see here, the best one is still included. I write a bunch of new premises and I repeat this process. I repeat this a few times. And all the time I'm getting feedback from players. I like this, I don't like that. I like this, I don't like that. Repeat it, for example, 20 times. Each time I write five different premises, I do another round. I repeat this process, and eventually we start finding out themes that do work. For example, in, in the case that I previously did, I found out that the target audience is really enjoying mysteries. They like realistic stuff. Stuff needs to make sense. Historical stuff seems to be cool. Altruism, helping others, not being selfish, seems to be a big thing for them. And then, Relationships, supernatural stuff, comedy, and apparently dead bodies are not relaxing also. That was a surprise. But it might be that I'm just bad at writing comedy or uh, love relationship-related stuff, that sort of thing. But then again, if I'm making the game, that's something that I need to take into account also. So these types of learnings you can have when you're doing it. These can guide you moving forward as you're developing your game. So. Now we've somehow created, we've, after multiple rounds of testing, we are capable of figuring out what kind of a premise the game could have, what at least some sort of a scope of these are the types of premises that could work for this audience. That's important. Then you can go on and test, for example, visual style. I don't know exactly how this could be done effectively. This is super costly, because going from text-only testing, a single iteration can take you about a day or two days or whatever. We're talking about a few days. But when you go to visual testing, we're talking probably about weeks for one single visual concept for a game. So anyways, it's something that we haven't really cracked. We don't have a silver bullet for this. It seems to be at the moment that visual testing just requires a lot of work. We're looking into AI solutions, but that's something that we haven't really figured out yet. But be as it may, once the game concept, once you've tested all the aspects of your game concept, the visual style, the premise, some sorts of game mechanical uh, gimmicks if you want to try them out and so forth, then you have a playable prototype and you start testing that playable prototype. And the, uh, we've extended kind of regularly, you'd use Playtest Cloud 
or similar services that the playable prototype just for UX testing and that sort of stuff. What we try to do in this enthusiasm stage already is to try and see if there's some sort of wow factor for the player in a way. Um, oops. Some sort of wow factor for the player over there, basically. The players, if you pay the players to play for 10 minutes and they end up playing 10 minutes and they complain all the time, it's, your game is probably not it doesn't have that type of a pool that you'd want to, even though the UX might be perfect. They might just like play it exactly how it's supposed to be played, but the UX might, uh, uh, the, the enthusiasm is not there. That'll tell you already something. And in an opposite example, if you pay them to play for 10 minutes and they play for 50 minutes, then you probably have something in your hands, something that's quite exceptional if they're just willingly extending their playtime quite a bit. But that's a story for a different, <laughs> different time. It'll take some time. But anyways, once you've got to the stage where you have your game fantasy wrapped up, you have a bunch of premises, for example, that would potentially work, you should already know at this time that the premise, whichever premise you choose out of these ones, should not be a complete mismatch for the audience that you're developing your game for. And yeah, as mentioned, Testing the enthusiasm is the next step, and as I described, you could already start thinking about these kind of things on how to, how to gauge for enthusiasm. Players who play longer than you pay them for, they're usually enthusiastic. When you listen to players play the game, that's quite, of a, quite a good <coughs> marker for enthusiasm. If players are constantly having these moments of like, wow, yeah, this is cool, that's awesome, and that sort of stuff, that's usually a good marker for enthusiasm. If your players are constantly complaining, it's like, I don't know, like this, like, ah, this is totally not for me, and that sort of stuff. That's probably a bad sign. You should probably do something about your game at that point. So, to recap what we've been talking about, the idea of this method that we're using is to build confidence step by step. There's a lot of inaccuracy, and there's a lot of uncertainty in the beginning. I get, I have lines of people outside of my room at the office telling me that, yeah, this is not statistically significant, that this is not that and this is not that. And that's not the point. This is not trying to be an exact science. This is trying to give us leads. This is trying to kind of point us to the right direction and avoid obvious pitfalls. Like trying to offer sci-fi games to my mom wouldn't work at all. And these types of pitfalls we try to avoid. And. Uh, <clears throat> Doing multiple rounds of testing, I think, is key in these type of methods. Because a single round, you do, I don't know, 30, 40, 100 answers of whatever your survey might have. It's not really going to be super important, uh, the numbers. But once you do it multiple times, you do 20 rounds, you do 50 rounds or something like that, and you see a pattern repeating, you see certain concepts that are constantly being getting good ratings, you start building up this confidence as you move forward. And it's not an exact science. You don't, can't expect dire answers. You can't expect these kind of definitive answers that this is definitely going to be a hit. You should invest all your money into this thing. There's never going to be anything like that in your hands. But you'll get more confidence. That's the whole point. And statistically significant data, I have mathematicians telling me that this is not statistically significant, but it's still better than nothing. So zero people playing your game is probably the worst case. 10 is way better than zero, 100 is better than 10, and so forth. And we haven't, as mentioned, this is pretty experimental for us at the moment. We haven't ironed out all the details. We do believe that the direction we've chosen is the correct way, but there's a lot of kind of uh, uncertainties in how we should write text premises, as I mentioned, how we should test for visual concepts and that sort of stuff. These have not been ironed out. We're working, we're trying to kind of, <clears throat> we're making this up as we go. But this, uh, this far, it seems to be producing pretty good results for us. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was, uh, that was good. Um, Thanks to me, not him. We must be right. But does anybody have one quick question before we move on? There is one. We, you have to ask the rest out there. Do we have a, a mic? We can just give this, this chap. Do we have a, a roving mic? No. Maybe you can start to repeat my question. Yes. Okay, I'll repeat your question. 
how do you define your target audiences? So I think that is something that we just start with. We define what kind of a game do we want to make. For example, uh, let's say <clears throat> King does a new Candy Crush game and they want to make a follow-up for Candy Crush. That would be something that they pretty much already know what kind of an audience Candy Crush has and that sort of stuff. Or Supercell does a not new Clash game or something like that. So that's where we usually start. We try to stake our claim at some point. We define our... We already know what audience we're going after. And that's key because we need to focus these tests on some sort of an audience. You could potentially maybe go the other way around also in a way that you just make a concept and you try to see what kind of audience this resonates to. I haven't tried it out myself, but I, would, might, I think it might be a valid, also valid approach to the same methodology. Cool. cool. Thank you so much. I'm sure there's many more questions, but I'm sure you can grab yes. Teppo outside. Thank you so much, Teppo. Thank a you. Great start.